Super Show. The Aquabats Super Show. Hello, everyone. We are the, the Aquabats. Aquabats. And welcome to the Aquabats Super Show Super Marathon. Behind the scenes, look at us, the, the Aquabats. Aquabats. We're really excited today, aren't we, guys? So excited. Yes. There's so much fun we're going to have with this Super Marathon. It's more fun than we've ever had at a Super Marathon because clearly we're not running a lot of marathons. Nope. The point is... We're going to be taking questions. We're going to be showing you some behind-the-scenes tidbits. We're going to show you some tids and some bits, <laughs> actual props from the shows. We're going to try to define what tidbits are. We're going to go all out for you because you're here for a marathon, and that means you're going to run the extra miles, or as we say in Canada, kilometers. Hey, guys, who is our favorite supervillain on the TV show and why? Well, you know what? Uh, I had a, a special fondness for uh, Ron Mark because he was so annoying. We were trying to play a show. We were playing, trying to play a song for his girl. He kept popping into the tent. And, uh, yeah, he, he apparently was so cool. And I was like, can we get on with this already? I mean, come on, right? It's true. So cool. He's too cool. Yeah, that was he was kind of annoying bad guy. And what's interesting about Ron Mark is he was kind of like a real person. He, he was until the very end. Of until course, he, wasn't he, a real he transformed. Anymore. But real people can be supervillains, kids. Just, just be careful. Yeah. Kind of like Evil Ricky. That's true. <laughs> Ricky, Ricky, that's a good one. Yeah. Oh, yeah. that was a good one from yeah. from the Thingy episode. Yeah. Oh yeah. yeah. Be careful where you buy your coffee. That was a good episode. That I, I really liked Evil Ricky. Actually, he was very complimentary. He was. Ricky was the best mm. Aquabat. Real no, Ricky was no offense. Though. Speaking yeah. of the Thingy, Much. I think the Thingy was my favorite. Evil villain. Oh yeah, yeah. Ricky the way thingy. he like was like walking around him. Mm -hmm. <laughs> He's one bad thing. With like, evil like, plans. With the thing, he opened the door and his like big long fingers were like. Bleh, bleh, bleh. Yeah, yeah. I I agree. I think I like that one. I hate he, the snow. You you don't like the snow? That was a super. Oh, that was a super villain for you. Crash's super villain was villain. the, the snow. snow. <laughs> Eagle bones. How about you? I don't consider him a villain, but Eagle Claw. Ah, yeah. Because he's my brother. He's, he's your brother! He's my favorite. Yeah. Come on, give, give us a little bit of that. Come on, he's my... He's my brother! <laughs> Perfect. Ah, that was great. That's true. Man, I can't think of a... He still is my brother. So for you, somewhere. it's Eagle Claw. For you, it was the thingy. For you, it was Ron Mark. Ron Mark, yeah. For you, it was... Evil Ricky and the snow. <laughs> and the snow. <laughs> I can't think. Is that the name of the next record? I can't think of a supervillain. I, I guess let's just go back. I, I'll, I'll just give it to Cobra Man because Cobra Man, I mean, between his beautiful baritone voice stylings and uh, the fact that he was a snake with snake hands that shot snakes out of his hands, that's, that's kind of pretty that's cool. Kind of a triple threat. That's yeah, really he's a snake face with snake hands that shot snakes out of his hands. Like, I mean, that's like Who that's like that? snakes that? to the max. Yeah, yeah. right. All right, that was a good good answers, guys. Good answers. Yay. All right. We uh, did it. We did it. Did we win? Well, see you later. Survey says. So we've been asked a question: Whose idea was it to make the circular story in season one? And can we explain what the circular story is? Can hey, anyone? Hey, what is the circular story? Can anyone just what is it? Break it down. Upper break it down. All right. Eagle Bones, you sure. went to you it's went to school. It's a time loop. A so time loop. The, uh, the first cartoon of the uh, Aquabat Super Show is where the last uh, live action episode ends, right? Right. And the last cartoon episode is where the live action had begun. Right. Whoa. So it was a crazy time loop that we threw everybody in. It was kind of like the beginning of the end, of the beginning. That's true. And it's just a big crazy time loop. If you watch, If you watch the show very carefully, you'll realize that the first cartoon is the last live action frame of the show. Right. It's like mm -hmm. a big circle. Like some shows are like a triangle or a square or even maybe a hexagon. But our show was a circle. It's a circle. Mm -hmm. I had mm -hmm. no idea. Yeah. yeah. So you, are you saying the audience was thrown for a loop? <laughs> I think perhaps. they were. I think they were. Per, did you say perhaps? Perhaps. Hmm. He is smart. Very intellectual of you, Eagle Bones. Perhaps. The yes. You know, whose idea was it? We were all making a show that was fun. And our head story editor, mm -hmm. writer, Danny McKiley, who actually wrote on the show called SpongeBob Super Pants. 
Hmm. SpongeBob super pants. That is that? Is that I should, I, we should is check that, that out. SpongeBob sweatpants. Yeah, it's a superhero sweat that lives sponge. under the sea and he has sweatpants on. Yeah. No, Danny. Danny uh, wrote for uh, SpongeBob SquarePants. He came on our show to story edit, and right as we were getting towards the end of the season, he's like, "Hey guys, I have an idea. What if we tied?" all the episodes into each other, and we created a time loop. And we were like, dude, what are you smoking, man? <laughs> You're crazy. It kind of hurts my head to think about it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And it did. It hurt my head, too, because we hadn't slept in weeks. Yep. At the time, uh, we weren't really sure, but millions of dollars later, it worked out. <laughs> <laughs> Lots of therapy later. Anyway, Danny McKiley. SpongeBob sweatpants. Danny McKiley made an appearance. He actually in was the show. in. The, that's right. He really was really quickly. The show. Yeah, he what? was one of the miners. That's right. Uh, that we blew up their mind in the uh, Cowboy Android episode. Yeah, mm. he was. He was one of the, one miners. of the disgruntled miners. He's a great disgruntled writer. Disgruntled miner number two. Great writer, great guy, and what a great idea! And it, I think it blew a few minds, including our own minds. Yeah. Mind. So we we would like wow. to take the credit for yeah. coming up with such a great idea, but. We were so busy acting, you know, perfecting our craft, that we forgot to be smart. Right? Yeah. So we have a little show and tell here. Some props from the Super Show. What is this, Ricky? Mad props. I believe this is from season one, the Monant episode. I think it's Manant. Mm-hmm. That's Monant. I think it's Monant. So one of you is saying it wrong. <laughs> Look at this poor thing. Yes, this was uh, one of the, the... I think we had two... Uh, foam ants, right? Blew up. That we blew up at the end, and we. How did they blow so up? They again? weren't real ants; they were harmed. Those big ants, giant. Wait, ants there's no explanation as to how they blew. Yeah, up. why did they blow up again? Like, did this, oh, well, they, I kicked them. He kicked them. I kicked them. Kicked them. Oh, that's right. You kicked, they, of course they're gonna explode. You kicked it so hard it just exploded <laughs> in the air. Right? They're combustible. Yeah. yeah. So that was yeah. one of the things we wanted to have lots of explosions on our show, and if we could have put like a gas tank inside of this, we probably would have blown it up into flames if we had the budget to do that. But these were styrofoam ants that were. They were sculpted, and they were fully cool-looking foam ants, and we put d- deck cord in them and stuffed them with explosives and blew, <laughs> blew them up. As it's, you do. As Practical. you do. And this is uh, one of the last remaining pieces of one of them. There was two. So Don't forget the mandible. All right. <laughs> what do we have next? We have a trophy. Ooh, a trophy. Is that my trophy? Crash yeah, McLarson. This is yours, Crash. So this is the first and last trophy I've ever won. <laughs> and I won this because I was the only one who was able to beat an Ubercon at his own game. Ubercon. I beat him. <laughs> Ubercon. I didn't even know what I was doing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this is the actual trophy from the show. This is Crash McLarson, the only person to beat an Ubercon at his own game. And this uh, Aquabat that was sculpted on top, someone actually made yeah. this. I believe uh, that is unique. A fresh, unique one. And yeah. I'm surprised that it didn't break when Eagle Bones picked it up. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> so there it is. It's, it's still Meow. solid. We've got a kitty head. This is the kitty litter mask from the kitty litter episode of the show, which actually kitty litter was a character that used to come out at our live shows, someone would come out with a cat costume on and, like, a trash can full of trash. It's Kitty Litter. And if you think about it, Kitty Litter's probably the best villain name ever. It is pretty good. <laughs> so Kitty Litter would come out with a trash can full of trash and start throwing it in the audience at people. But now he's got an eye patch. Yeah. Which yeah. is we, the best. We made him tough. Yeah, I think he's a congressman now, so. <laughs> 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 anyway, so Kitty Litter became a, a character from the live show that became a character on the TV show. Mm-hmm. And his thing is that he's just a cat that likes trash. So, Looks like we have Monster Ron Mark right here. So Ron Mark is a character yep. from the, uh, w- the Night, of, Night of the Cactus yep. episode of the first season. And at the end of Night of the Cactus, he gets sprayed in the face by the meteor. Rock, rock juice. Right. Yeah. So then he comes back in the first episode of season, meteor, right. season two, with, and this is his True. new rock juice enhanced mm-hmm. Ron Mark. And we made this uh, doll of him for, there's a scene in Return of the Aquabats episode one of season two where Crash, you know, Ron Mark is beating us all up and thrashing us around. Crash gets mad grows big and then picks Ron Mark up and chucks him, right? Into a lake. Into a lake. Supposedly. But Na- naturally. What the scene was in the script was Crash picks him up, yells at him, and throws him. And you actually did throw this guy. 
into a bush, and that's why some of these tentacles are <laughs> broken off because he got smashed into a bush. Kind of like bush broken. Cthulhu. Yeah, totally. But uh, the, the way it was written in the script was he crashed through him, and then he landed into a lake, and then the lake exploded. Yeah. As it happens. Yeah. But we didn't have a budget to explode a lake. But we did budget it out. And Next figure season. How, we how, we how, shot part of it, right? Yeah, we did. We shot the guys that, like, plunged it because it was like the lake was under construction, and we blew the lake. Anyway. We we tried to build a, a miniature lake so we could land the miniature in it, and it was just way too much money. But we wanted to blow it up because we had these pyrotechnic guys on season two. They were ready to go. So between season one and season two, we got a new pyrotechnic team that were out of state. So the season one pyrotechnic team were in California where there's lots of restrictions, a lot of safety laws, and you know you can't light fires and. You can't breathe it that into be? your soup too loud. You know what I mean? So yeah. we we moved the production to Utah, and there's these, I don't want to say hillbilly, but they were very um, country-esque type men. They weren't as worried about it. With explosions. They're they like to blow things up. Yeah, and they were like, anytime we can blow anything up, we will blow it up. So we tried to write explosions into almost every episode. So we used our own judgment for safety. And they would, uh, they would yeah. juice it up, too. I mean, oh, yeah. they would add they, they, way more than they should have. There's that scene in uh, the fountain? Summer Camp where, where, where I'm shooting at the, like, the wear ape with that gun, and they put, like, a propane popper, like a propane tank exploded. And there was like 50 kids or something, right? Yeah. Pretty close to it. We're like, what? In like a got? city park. Yeah, that could, never happened. Yeah, that you was could, like, you could feel the heat. Like, <laughs> we shot that out like at that like Christmas village kind of setup that we had done. And then <laughs> yeah. we were, we were oh, like yeah. 100 yards away and like flaming smoldering. Yeah, it, pieces it like of lit the green screen on fire. Ah, it was like, set some trees on fire. Yeah, anyway. They oh, were, yeah. But it looked <laughs> great. <laughs> they were no, passionate no, no, no. about their craft. Yeah. And God bless them. All right, we've been asked a question. What are the shows that had the most impact on how the super show looked? Like, what were the shows we watched that influenced us to create the super show to look the way it did? Guys, throw it out there because there's a whole bunch of them. Batman? Married with children? Yeah. <laughs> That's right. We wanted the Al Bundy cam to follow me around. Yeah. <laughs> a lot of newspapers. Ricky, you said... Uh, a, a, Batman, the the Adam West Batman. Batman. Yeah. I think is the mm. biggest one. Batman 66, right? I think part of that had to do with the way the show was flat lit. There was not a lot, a ton of shadows. And when there were shadows, it usually meant there was a villain present. And also Dutch we, angle. lots of Dutch angles. We Never picked up on that. We turned the camera, when the villains would show up, we'd turn the camera this way, mm. just like they did in the old Batman. Very good observations, boys. Yeah. What I'd else? Say, so, uh, I feel like I channeled my character into Speed Racer, the whole series. You were at Speed Racer no, the whole no. show. <laughs> How about Rocky and Bullwinkle? Oh yeah, sure. Yeah, our the show looks they... a lot like Rocky and Bullwinkle. Well, the way that the way the show was paced and shifting from uh, you know one story to another, and sure. But I think they're talking about maybe just the look of the show. The oh. look. Oh. I would say the uh, original Star Trek Star series. Trek. Star Trek. Didn't right. we even have some set pieces from? That we rented from That's right. the yeah. original Star Trek. Total Star Trek. That's vibe. true. Uh, uh, Jimmy the Robots, uh, uh, like all the, you know. All the buttons and knobs and switches. Were In your from, laboratory, right? They were actually from... From the original Star Trek. They, they were the real set. Created for the Star mm -hmm. Trek show. Yeah, so, Crash, did you have... Johnny Sacco? Johnny Sacco, yes, very much so. Johnny Sacco and his flying robot, if you're unfamiliar with Giant Robo, it's a show called Giant Robo in Japan, and it became Johnny Sacco and his flying robot here in America. That had a big influence on the show, the way it looked, the cheesiness of the villains and the walk-around characters. But, you know, Star Trek, Batman, uh, Johnny Sacco, Ultraman, the A-Team. Uh, MacGyver. Uh, intentionally, we lit the show, really, and we painted all the sets, and everything was very colorful, but we saturated things in post, where, and so we lit, we lit everything really bright so that we could turn up all the colors after we shot it. So all those shows, Star Trek, what else? And we also... Kamen Rider. Yeah, Kamen Rider, uh... We even were influenced by shows that were shot on video like The Young Ones, you know, like Young Ones or Doctor Who, early Doctor Who, right? The Tom sure. Baker Doctor Who that was shot on video. And when you would see like a light come in, it would streak the cameras. Anyway, we like all that cheesy stuff. What about Battlestar Galactica? You guys like that show? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Sorry, nerd alert. 
All right, so we got to ask a question. How long were we thinking about making the Aquabats TV show? And how long did it take? And then over the years, how did it change from our original vision of the show to what it ended up being? Would anyone like to jump in with that? Maybe Crash, since you're the... Yeah. You can remember that far I mean, back. I think even since the very early days of the band, we thought it would it would make an awesome TV show, but it didn't really seem real. But we still tried to do it anyways. And the first pilot we did, the Buena Vista one, didn't really, it wasn't really what we wanted it to be. It just came out that way because of things that weren't really necessarily in our control. So we learned what we didn't like from the first one. That's true. We learned early on, uh, kind of we tested it out with a pilot that we did for Disney and Buena Vista, that uh, like shooting it indoors and on video and, you know, kind of cheesy flash graphics. It just yeah. it just made it look extra hokey when we were trying to be hokey, but like in a stylish way. You probably sure. learned not to listen to people and listen to your heart. That's true. Just mm -hmm. like Daniel LaRusso from The Karate Kid yeah. learned from Mr. Miyagi that true strength come from the heart. Comes from the heart. And yeah, that's where it comes from. <laughs> but to your heart. <laughs> Over the years, I think from the early days of the show, the vision that we had for the show to how it ended up, I mean, we shot that Disney pilot in 1998, and we actually made the show in 2011. So who's good at math? How many years was that in between? 17. 13. Is it? 13 years? 98 to 11. 98 to 11. 13 years? He's a robot. You got to believe it. It's right. Okay. It's so true. It took us 13 years to finally get it, get it made. I think we shot a pilot in 2009, uh, which is 10 years later, 11 years later. 2008. So 10 eight. years we, eight. it took eight. us in between. Eight. Eight. And we finally did it the way. The pilot, too. Uh, that was in 99, yeah. The in that, that was after we did the, the Buena Vista pilot. Oh, in color. The Aquabats in color, which mm -hmm. was closer to how we wanted the show to look. And then eventually when we, we did the pilot in 2009 and then the super show was a, how we wanted to, the show to look. So um, learning from your mistakes makes perfection. That's right. Just ask any country. That's right. Whose GDP is below... 1,000 millions. <laughs> so we've been asked to talk a little bit more about the Aquabats in color, mm -hmm. which was, you know, Crash was talking about in 1998, we made a pilot for Buena Vista. It yep. didn't really turn out how we wanted to. So we wanted to try to pitch a, a different version of the show, and we called it... The Aquabats in, in color. color. The Aquabats in color, which was kind of a given because by then, it, believe it or not, by... 1999 most people had color television yes every, I, everybody on my block had a color yeah. tv so. i don't i think everyone had one did you, did you have a mm -hmm. color tv by yes. then crash <laughs> yeah there we go. so we called it the aquabats in color because that would be funny and <laughs> then we uh we were on golden voice records and we were making a, an album called floating eye of death and uh we were given a budget to make a music video and we took that budget and we made a little short yeah. pilot esque. We went back to the record company and said, ta da! <laughs> Here's the music video. We just haven't cut it into the music video yet. So Any day now. Fortunately, the record label went under before we got in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> Thank goodness. <laughs> they went out of business right when they got the news. There was music in that. Oh, yeah, there was music. It counted. Oh, yeah. And that was the song they wanted us to do a video for. So <laughs> that was the song. Sequence of Race was the song, yeah, right? Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, most of that, that Aquabats in words. Color was shot right where That's right. we shot the first season of the Aquabats TV show. Yeah, the irony you, uh, of that is, yeah. right, is we shot the Aquabats in Color in 1999 at Oak Canyon Ranch in Irvine Lake. Mm -hmm. And that's where we shot the whole season, first season of the Aquabats Super yep. Show. You might be able to see some of those backgrounds and landscapes uh, before we even got there a decade they later. They say the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over and yeah. expecting a different a result. Different result. Yeah. But we proved that you can do the same thing mm -hmm. over again you can, and have a different result. You can still be insane <laughs> and still get a different result. <laughs> the, the funny thing is by the end of season one, it just felt like we were just at the park, like <laughs> shooting a show between soccer goals. <laughs> you know what I mean? Well, should we shoot the scene with trees or with dirt? <laughs> Uh, let's go for dirt this scene. One of my favorite scenes from season one is 
Jimmy running away from. Uh, oh yeah. From the dirt into the trees. From the dirt into the trees, because yeah. you're you're mad that you that the. the and then I come back with a real chicken. That's right. The baby chicken ran away, and you mm -hmm. were angry, and so you. I was, I mean, yeah. Okay. The real chicken that relieved itself on you. Yeah. Oh well, it, 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 on the <laughs> on the ground in front of me. It's yeah. in the show. Yeah. When, chicken had a little rest stop in the middle of the show. So. Well, the chicken got nervous. <laughs> All right. Mm -hmm. So, we also got to ask another question. So we had the. The, 99, the 98 pilot with Disney, then we did a 99, the Aquabats in color, and then in 2009, we 2008. did... 2008. 2008. You sure it was 2008? Maybe we just finished it in 2009. But we started shooting it in... He's got a calendar in his school, pocket. So he knows. Yes. We shot the Aquabats super show demo with the Tortilla Trouble episode, right? Mm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Where we the Aquabats go on vacation in Mexico, and what happened, Ricky? Um, we encounter a big giant tortilla monster <laughs> and a, a radioactive tortilla <laughs> that shoots beans at people. Beans out, out of its mouth. And it's maybe at the everywhere. time that Where's seemed that a little bit, um, I don't know, insensitive. But Ricky, you, what did you think? I I thought it was great. <laughs> See? Hey, but I drop a what's wrong? Craft. What's what's wrong with beans coming out of a tortilla's mouth? That's what they Makes usually. Sense. If you go to Taco Bell and you order a bean and cheese burrito and you squeeze it, what it comes out? What one happens? Minute. That's it right. Does. Definitely. Does. That's right. Beans fly everywhere. So we just wanted to capitalize just awareness. That's right. We wanted to create awareness, yep, no doubt, and prevent any. Beware if you buy a and bean what and cheese burrito what from Taco if Bell. You shoot a beans giant might laser shoot everywhere. At a tortilla. What's going to lesson happen? learned, That's, everybody? Yes. It's cook it. It's going to cook it. So we. What's going to rain? Tortilla, tortilla chips. chips. Tortilla chips. So that's how we Finally. solved the problem, right? And you, you, Eagle Bones, you were a new member of the band at the time, and one of your yeah. first greatest acting moments was getting hit in the face with... Refried ten, beans. Ten pounds of refried beans. Power, yeah. Power hosed with <laughs> a couple gallons of refried beans. Didn't you have like beans up in your sinuses for oh, a while? Yeah, I was bad. Yeah, got way up in there. <laughs> way days. up in there. Let that be a lesson, kids. <laughs> Turn your enemies into delicious snacks. <laughs> anyway, so yeah, we shot that in the hopes of landing a, a, a network television. We showed that around, and actually, there were some networks that were pretty interested, and. Uh, they let us know they were pretty pretty yeah. interested. <laughs> Tortillas shooting beans? Uh, I'm listening. And ultimately, that landed us the Aquabat Super Show with the hub. Honest that, and for true. That was it. That was the one. All right, so we've been asked what each one of our favorite songs that was created originally for the Super Show, what our favorite songs were. So while I'm vamping and trying to think of something, I'm going to... Ask one of the other guys who de have a definite answer ready at the tip of their tongue. Jimmy the Robot. Hi, how's it going? I'm Jimmy the Robot. And let me tell you, uh, I've got a couple options. First, I enjoyed being able to sing some songs on the show. Uh, the Thingy song was one of my favorites. It was a little challenging. It was written by a, uh, a good friend of ours, uh, a good friend of ours uh, Warren Fitzgerald from the Vandals. And uh, he challenged me with this uh, incredible song, and I uh, got to lay it down, and uh, yeah, I think it worked out pretty well. That's from season two, right? That's the, from the season thingy. two, sure, yeah. from yeah. the thingy. It's a very, uh, you know, theatrical number. Yes, of course. He's one small thingy with evil plans. That one's fun. Mm -hmm. That's a good one. How I about like, um, my favorite one is, I don't know, I think I'm going to get it wrong, but it's Open the Worm and Get Your Mama Out. Oh, yes. <laughs> I mean, just that title alone, isn't that just sell it? Open the worm and get your mama out. Yeah, I, I'd buy that record. Yeah, open the worm and get your mama out. That's, that's <laughs> one of that's one of our favorite songs. And do you remember who wrote that song? Yeah, I believe that was Matt Gorney. Matt Gorney. One of our friends, Matt Gorney, who's who's basically like a member of the band, but we don't really want him to be in the band because he's a little bit. <laughs> I don't just, know. He's, he's, he's like too him. good. Yeah, he's just too good. He's yeah. too, he's he's too, good. He'll make he's us too look good. bad is what it is. Yeah. Anyway, good at chess, bad at life. Anyway, Matt Gorney, <laughs> <laughs> ah. he, he wrote that song, Over the Worm and Get Your Mama Out. And, th and that was, you guys have a favorite song? I don't know if this counts, but it's taken from one of the scores of Cobra Man, and it's actually on the soundtrack that we released, and it's the Cobra Man hip-hop song. So it's not really a song, but it's a part of the score that was taken well, turned it, into a song. It is a song because we we 
we recorded sure. it for the show, used some of the score, and then we made it for the end credits. Yes. Right, right, right. We wrapped over it and mm-hmm. put it so in the it end. So it does count. Yeah, it counts. Oh, I, yeah. I, w- I will add the the Ricky wrote a song that was the I Summon the Dude theme. Oh, yeah. Oh, actually, yeah. It's not really so a song, but it's like a piece of music, right? When you summon the dude on the show, and it goes... Right. I can't take all the credit for that. Jimmy the Robot and myself, we both came up with that. So. Yeah, we were, we were working together. We hand, needed I guess hand, I, I added a little bit. Hand and you did. metal yeah, hand. I guess we all kind we needed of two collaborated to make yeah. something good enough yep. for that. So that brings part. up an, a, another question that we, we were given about the songwriting process on the show, because clearly we wrote with other people like Warren and Matt Gorney. Mm-hmm. But what, what about us? We also wrote stuff, too, for the show. Would anyone want to talk to the process, Crash? I know you wrote some songs. You wrote some songs, Jimmy. Yeah, I mean, it was cool because we would get an actual idea, and then we would try to come up with a hundred different ideas and usually we would throw away 99 of them and use the one. <laughs> that's that's right. a tall pile. Sometimes like doing science, song. we combine two together. Oh, that's right. Yeah. Because I wrote a doing science song, but the chorus wasn't very good, so we took a chorus from one of Crash's songs and... Mashed them together. Yeah, that's right. Mash a potato. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. ultimately the, the songwriting process was we would have an idea that came from the script and then everyone would take a stab at at like the song, everyone and, do a doing science song, and then we it was pretty diplomatic how we would kind of vote or say like oh this is the best one or and usually it was pretty evident like yeah there was a couple times we disagreed like no the song's better but I don't, not not too much right I mean it's pretty usually yeah, right. there's usually kind of a clear a clear runner a clear <laughs> path the best way to write a song is any way you can a, a cool thing also any is way you want it learning and growing yeah, you, you had an opportunity to write for yourself like the Christmas episode like hey. You're doing this part. You want to write a song for it? <laughs> okay. That's right. So that Christmas yeah. song, you wrote that song. I did. Yeah. So that's kind of cool, too. And you get to take a stab at it. Just so you know, when you sing that song, I get the chills on the back of my neck, and like the hairs go up, and I get a little tear, because that's my, that's my buddy Ricky right there singing a song. He He's wrote doing it. He's doing <laughs> it. About his favorite holiday. You don't even know. <laughs> Christmas. Anyway, that's pretty much how it goes, and mm-hmm. it's super fun. That's probably the, one of the best parts of making this show. Definitely filming the show is the least fun part of the show. <laughs> Making everything else is the fun part. The first hey. hour is super fun. Yeah, the first, yeah, the first hour, hour or two is yeah. good. But the like 16th hour. 12th, uh, yeah, 16th <laughs> hour when you're lying in the dirt getting beat by yeah. buckets of slime, <laughs> you, freezing weather. You've been on the set for 14 hours, and it's they're fun. like, okay, guys, we, run up that hill in the rain. Get whipped again. Get we're going to bury again. you in a box in the Jump snow, in the and, just, uh, we're gonna, and uh, just hang out. Go to the hospital. Okay, we've got to do it all over again, but from the other side. And now go back to the studio and write a song we have to sing tomorrow yeah. in tomorrow's episode. Tetanus so. schmetness. <laughs> so one of the questions we got was about another character on our show. I mean, there's five Aquabats, but really there's a sixth character on the show that's not here because she can't fit in here. I'm not talking about the dude. I'm talking about the battle tram. Mm. Guys, where did the battle tram come from? What was the inspiration? And I can't remember the other part of the question that was who asked, but who made it? Change oh, who made over it? time. Yeah. Yeah, we could talk about that. Let's talk about well, it. Well, first the, we started... There's Battle Tram 1.0, right? That's for right. the pilot. Yep. Then there's the Battle Tram 2.0. More aerodynamics. <laughs> Bigger. Yeah, we started so, with the Winnebago. That's Which right. Unique. We figured every superhero group has a, a vehicle that they fly around in, whether it's, you know, Wonder Woman and her Mr. invisible Mr. plane or the... Batmobile. The, the Batmobile. I mean, the... The team van. superhero team has to get from point A to point B, and there was mm-hmm. a show... Uh, on when I was a kid, it was called uh, Shazam and Captain Marvel, and this kid, Billy Batson, and Mentor would drive around in this Winnebago, and I just kind of thought that was a funny superhero vehicle, a motorhome. I thought that was a funny one. So we thought it would be funny if we made the Aquabats super vehicle (laughs) a a leisure (laughs) motorhome, a luxury motorhome, because it's kind of silly. And also... There's a movie called Stripes, if yes, you remember. Bill Murray. Bill Murray and uh, Ivan Reitman Harold, Harold directed, Ramis. Harold Ramis. Yeah, they had a Winnebago. That's right. And that was like the super souped up. Oh, yeah. That was the... the, the what the was it assault, called? Uh, the assault vehicle. The it's assault the, vehicle, yeah. 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 And it had yeah. missiles that came out of oh, it. And, yeah. Oh, yeah. But it, was, it looked and, like... And the, the, the back door like flopped down that's like right. ours did. I mean, so yeah. really, I think if all the superhero vehicles that had the biggest influence on the battle tram, it was that from Stripes. Stripes, yeah. Because if you watch Stripes... John Can ...with Bill Murray, it's the same exact model. Like this, it is. It's the same car that we ended up using on the show. 
is the uh, it's a tactical assault 1978 vehicle. GMC motorhome. We didn't talk about Cosmic Joe. Oh, yes. yes. So we found a 1978 GMC motorhome. The seventh member of the Aquaman. Yes, and then we called our friend Cosmic Joe, uh, Cosmic Joe uh, Filardi. He has a, a chop shop in Santa Ana, and he uh, went to work. Fabricator. Yeah, he worked. Yeah. He went to work. He knows metal. But he had uh, fiberglass. And yeah, fiberglass. And we got, bondo. we got a guy named uh, Eddie to come out and do all the bondo and fiberglass in the back. And we we souped up a GMC motorhome, and it became became our home. And then the uh, the kind of like um, the inside is bigger than the outside thing comes from the whole Doctor Who really? uh, <laughs> TARDIS type of a thing, you know, where he. It suspends uh, spatial reasoning and all that stuff. That that's a superhero trope that we can't get enough of. <laughs> <laughs> trope. <laughs> yeah. Hey, no. these people will know what a trope means. Hey, and Cosmic Joe, he once built a ten uh, foot high uh, Vans shoe. That's right. Yeah. So if you if you're into Vans shoes, which we are, we're all into them. Our feet are into them at least. There's a Vans shoe golf cart that drives around that yeah. our. Our, the buddy, our buddy Cosmic Joe, that built we the battle tram. We went through tortillas from the top of it. That's right, at the warp tour. At the warp tour, fun times. Anyway, the battle tram is one of our favorite things. And it still exists about the Super Show. That's right. And there's still the name of the battle tram is pretty awesome too. The, the name battle tram. The, the battle tram. <laughs> <laughs> no one has a name that cool. Yeah, <laughs> just the word tram is funny. <laughs> Because it doesn't yeah, speed it, into battle. Yeah, it doesn't. Tram. It doesn't mean <laughs> it's like a tram is like tram. it's like sightseeing in the it battle. You know, it's yeah. like yeah. Yeah. I used to take a tram to get into Disneyland. Once upon a time. And if you look just over there, there's the foxholes of the enemy. Like yeah. it's like very. It's like, <laughs> <laughs> it was like a tour guide on the tram. Like uh oh, now, now oh missile tram. time. Like, Battle tram. If you look out to the right, you'll see Man Ant and his <laughs> legion of ants. Uh, That's right. What is tram? Is that short for something? It's marked backwards. I don't know. Tram, transportation. Uh, uh, Traumatic. I don't know. I just know from the Universal Studios tour that yeah. they, you get on the tram. So <laughs> we're they're, per they're purchased from Tramtopia. <laughs> if you want to go into battle, might as well get on the tram in luxury and comfort. <laughs> we have Ricky Fitness's. Shred Center name tag. Bam. This is from the Anti-Bats episode. This is. Where the Aquabats were guest judges at a battle of the bands at the Shred Center, mm. which is another uh, another version of uh, guitar, center. guitar Center. Shred Center. Because if you walk into a guitar center, you're going to hear someone shredding. I never Guaranteed. made that connection. Or Guaranteed. trying to shred. <laughs> Or many people trying to shred. All right, what we got here? It might sound like somebody throwing a... Ricky, uh, why do we have Ricky's? It's because Ricky's the one that ruined the whole episode. Thanks a lot, Ricky. I don't think I ruined it. Shred domination. You voted. Maybe I did. <laughs> we act like we can. Here we go. The gold card. Oh, yeah. That's the famous... MC Back Commander's gold card. We don't card. need this. <laughs> <laughs> this is the uh, Aquabats gold card, which uh, bought us a lot of items on the show. A lot of use. Heavy right? use on that card. <laughs> Technology. <laughs> <laughs> which is... Uh, what was the what's the uh, card company? It's Sir, Char Sir Charge a lot. Sir Charge a lot credit card company. <laughs> you see, have you ever looked at it? Can you give it's me very the, detailed the three digit code on the back of that really quick? <laughs> uh, see if it yeah. works. It's eight seven four. Dear Amazon. <laughs> Hello, I'd take. I never want to leave my house again. Ah, All right, this is a uh, robot head. This is a robot head from a seat. This the original it, battery from a, like ten years ago. There's a mm -hmm. switcher on it. I wonder if it I works. Think so. Did you, can you, can you see the button? It must. It was eight years ago. This is <laughs> this is a robot head from uh, the Return of the Aquabats, yeah. right? The first episode There's of the season. For some reason, I think the battery's dead. <laughs> Let me test it. <laughs> yeah. There's a switcher right here. So, anyway, this this part lit up, but this was that was, uh, that was from Return. This is where Jimmy uh, took unscrewed his head to distract Ron Mark, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And uh, the graphics, the, the way we did it was very uh, super convincing. It was like I'm still top of the line Hollywood graphics on that one, right? I mean, we we spared yeah. we spared no expense because in the thingy we actually did take my head off, so it was sitting on the table. That's and right. The body was over on the. That's right. Yeah. Anyway. 
Who knew that Jimmy the Robot could take his head off? Not me. Now you know. But, and I think the likeness is, I mean, just look at that. It's like the same guy. All right, one of the questions we've been asked was, how did the Aquabats become, they were a band of just the finest musicians, <laughs> probably some of the finest musicians in the world. And then how did you become some of the best actors in the world and become screen ready for such a test of your acting abilities? I mean, it's a real stretch. I mean, the arcs, the character arcs, the motivations, the emotion mm. going into playing these roles. I mean, it was like gut-wrenching. <sighs> Days of prep. Heart squeezing. Similar to a lot of careers where you spend a lot of time in school and studying, and then you don't really use any of that. It's just all on the job training. <laughs> That's right. So I think in the same way, we had a little bit of a crash course school for a week where we were doing uh, improvisation, learning how to improvisize. Yes, and do you remember that one time we were locked in the room for three days and we couldn't come out because we were improvising the whole three days? That was yeah. fun. Yeah. That was and yes, and, and we didn't have it. anything to eat. You know what happened? Yes, we were I was starving. We watched a lot of episodes of Veep, and we saw this guy. I don't think we that was like, on yet. No, it wasn't on yet. We, but he good, can good see point. The future. Don't worry about the timeline. <laughs> <laughs> I just like that he said crash course with no irony. Dang. Crash course. There's no irony in crash. No, but what you were saying, Jimmy, was we had a friend we, that we came had, in. We had, the, we had a friend, Matt Walsh. The who, best. Uh, well, we had seen him in The Hangover. That's right. He's also in the Upright Citizens Brigade, the yes. prominent member, leader of the Upright Citizens Brigade, the TV show, but also the the He's comedy never, school, comedy school, never. right? The Upright Citizens Brigade has a big school in L.A. They have a big school in New York. Mm -hmm. and a lot of comedians and young actors go through there. And so we called Matt and said, Matt, we're like super good actors, but we really need to learn how to be funny. <laughs> Got to brush up on the comedy a little bit. And he was like, okay, uh, how much can you pay me? <laughs> <laughs> you have to give a little bit of credit to our, the directors, too, who d definitely coached us on, like, use it by saying, hey, that sucked. Can you do it better? <laughs> Instead of doing what you were doing, <laughs> just do, do just the other way. <laughs> so I really like what you've done with that line. <laughs> that was, that was great, but do it again. <laughs> Not the way you just did it. <laughs> Cut. Perfect. That was great. Do it again. <laughs> when you think you're being funny on camera, you're not. It's, w it's when you're just yeah. kind of like... Yeah. And, and Matt Walsh helped us learn a lot of the keys to improvisation and um, making things funny and making things flow. Similarly to music, there's definitely an art and a flow to comedy and uh, acting that a lot of people don't really understand. But I don't understand. There's a rhythm to it, a rhythm. You know what I'm saying? Comedy. Comedy. <laughs> <laughs> so we also got a question about one of the greatest parts of the Aquabat Super Show is where we have commercials for products that don't actually exist yet. yet. That's right. Good call. Hey, Eagle Bones, up top. That's a high five in case you're wondering, kids. We actually touch each other in, in the past decades. <laughs> anyway, about that. So we have some commercials on the on the Super Show. They're part of the, the program. They're actually not real products. They're fake commercials, right? Wait. <laughs> yes, really. Uh, I'm still so waiting for those scabs to come. Yeah, out. scabs, the fruit chews that you put on your knees or your I arms. I thought I've been using handy gel uh, <laughs> yeah. on my handy uh, gel's not real. Handy gel exists day. in the show. Though. Some of them exist in the show. That's true in the show. So mm -hmm. we we wanted to incorporate a universe into the TV show. And then also put, make commercials for products that would be featured in the show because that's kind of uh, the American way. Yeah, it's <laughs> a way to do it. <laughs> so uh, we had a lot of fun coming up with those ideas, right? And at some point in the, in the production of the show, things got a little carried away and the show got really tricky to make. And so we... You know, every couple of days we'd have to cut a day out, and we would lo we lost a lot of time, and we didn't have a whole lot of time to focus on those commercials. So we farmed them out to people, and some of the people we farmed them out to was our friends at Mega, Mega sixty four, yeah. the uh, comedy geniuses so from uh, San Diego area. Uh, they did a, a number of commercials for us: the Handy Gel commercial. Mm -hmm. Uh, what were some of the other ones? Snakey Snacks. Snakey Snacks. Um, there's a few commercials they did. Did they do Meal Orang? Meal Orang, yeah. And then uh, our location manager on the show, a beautiful woman named Julianne Eggold, she came to us at the end of uh, a, 
a day of shooting and said, hey, guys, I know that we're behind schedule. We're not going to be able to get these commercials done. Could I just go make some commercials and then bring them back? And if you like them, you could use them. <laughs> and we were like, uh, hmm. In the spirit of, you know, sure, why not? Collaboration. <laughs> yes, and. <laughs> yeah, yes, and. It was all about improvisation and yes, and. And Julianne went home on the weekends and made commercials and would bring them back on, on the Mondays. So good. And they would be fully done. And at the time, you know, she was working a lot with Warren Fitzgerald, who did a lot of the music on them. But she came back... She she came back with the home some of the home run oh, commercials yeah. Yeah. like I think they're called bangers yeah, yeah. like uh, yeah. she did scabs she did uh, the high the high, high, pants? Weight, high, high, high pants, pants. That's a good one. Um, she did my favorite one the scruffy scruff scruffy scruff scruffy yeah. scruff scruffy scruff, 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 scruff is your pal featuring <laughs> yeah featuring Crash's, Keely Larson Crash's daughter Keely is oh, the, the, the mustache the one right Harry Hyder I think Harry Hyder was she did that one as well right. So that was just uh, Dirt Claw. Did she do Dirt Claw? She did Dirt Claw. Yeah, the Ring in a Can. Is that what it was? Called? I think that the, she the did Ring in a Can too. Yeah, so some of these were yeah. written. Some of these were written in the script, and then some of them were just like, okay, we didn't have an idea, so go for it. And and Julianne Make came up. something up. She came up with a bunch of that weren't written, but there were some that were written like High Tides. Ring in a Can, I think, was written, and uh, Little Brother, the Little stupid Brother. Phone. She did Stupid Phone. Stupid Phone. She did that anyway. What about so Instabro? Who did Instabro? Instabro, Instabro was my favorite. Was uh, one from the pilot. That was yeah. from the yeah. pilot. That's yeah. right. That's right. And our Instabro was none other than the, our very own Matt, Matt Gorney. Gorney. That's yeah. right. He owns the golf course. <laughs> <laughs> Matt Gorney. Anyway, I should. That I was a lot of fun. Baseball. And we and the great thing about those commercials is now we have we have own commercials of products that haven't come out yet. And we're going to put out a bunch of those products over the next year or so cuz a lot of people have been asking us. I mean, must be t 10 to 12 people at now. Least, at least. Yeah. Handfuls least. of dozens <laughs> have turned out. Anyway, so when your scruffy scruff comes in the mail, you'll know you did it. You really did it. So another question we got, for, which I don't know what this question is or where it came from, but we got a question that said, Dear Aquabats, in every episode there's this weird man in a fox costume that runs through an episode or is hiding in the background or is... And I don't, I don't know if this is like a joke? some uh, kind yeah, of Minecraft, Fortnite, mm. new school mm. thing that I don't know about. Is this like some kind of, I don't know. Is this like a character somebody built, like on the computer and I, then put it into It could be some kind yeah, of like CG. Do they call it a deep a fake? It could be a deep fake. Yeah. That's deep a false fake. flag deep fake yeah. conspiracy theory. That's the name of the next record, Deep Fake. <laughs> deep. I have no idea. What I don't know. What, we don't know what you're talking yeah. about. But if you are watching a show and you see a little fox person running through the episode, you may want to go to the doctor. All right, a question we got was, Aquabats, you've been a band since 1994. That's before I was born. Have you noticed a big change in your fans from before the Aquabats Super Show to after the Aquabats Super Show? Ready? Go. It became a lot more attractive. Really? Yeah, more handsome. More, more. Uh, yeah, because of the good show. looking. Yeah, they were just. There used looking. to be ten people, but now there's thirteen people. At our shows. <laughs> <laughs> that too. I, I mean, definitely dropped the age group of kids coming to a punk rock show for sure. Expand the age group. Yeah, that's you. right. Yeah. A lot more families <laughs> coming to the shows, like the whole family, which is kind of cool. Yeah. There was also like a craft service table available more with more candy and snacks. Mm. And that's what helped us get these strong muscles that we currently are holding on to and hurting our knees with. <laughs> I like how Matt Gorney timed the opening of his soda <laughs> right when he said snacks. Good job. Well it's, it seemed like before the Super Show, we had a lot of fans of, of music and people that knew uh, punk rock and Warp Tour and live music, and they were mm -hmm. music fans. And then once the show came out, we got a lot of fans that were that had no New idea fans. that we we're even a band, and so it, it got kind of fun on tour when we would go out on tour and there would be a bunch of kids <laughs> and families and soccer moms and they would did, had no idea that we were a band that like actually plugged into in amps and played music really loud and they would be shocked and then there would be people in the crowd with mohawks or whatever and they didn't even know we had a TV show so it was like that was interesting to see it's a weird <laughs> like. <laughs> conundrum dynamic. I just thought you guys were birthday cake toppers. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. <laughs> From Parties Are Us. 
Anyway, it, it, it definitely changed the dynamic, and it got a little weird for us because we would have stage divers jumping in the crowd, but right next to three-year-old kids and four-year-old kids, and so that we had to kind of figure out how to temper the dynamic of, of our crowd. It took a bit. second to navigate that. Still, that we start throwing, still figuring that out. Throwing kids at them. This yeah, so a, we just started spits. <laughs> throwing more kids into the crowd. <laughs> it just solved everything. It just yeah. made everything work. Yeah, as long as their parents would catch them. So we got a question about some of the guest stars on our show. We could talk about some of our favorite guest stars, if anyone would like to jump in. I would say my favorite would be Reese Darby. And he didn't know what he was getting into, I think, because <laughs> he played that character, like, perfectly. And I think he agreed to do the show because he really liked the character. But then um, he had to go in a cold ocean lake and freeze, and he wasn't really prepared for that. Yeah, Reese Darby from uh, Flight, Flight of the, of the Concords. Concords. Came so in and played a role, uh, the shark, shark fighter in the Shark Fighter episode. You think he might have been busy <laughs> if he had known? <laughs> he, <would've laughs> he, been busy. he may have gotten busy, but yeah, he he really reacted well to the script and was really excited to play the part. And you know, no offense yeah. to Reese, but we went out to a lot of different people to to play that part. David Lee Roth. And yeah, we went out to a, yeah, <laughs> yeah, David Lee Roth. That was my that was we, my dream. We went out to a lot of people. <laughs> Um, <laughs> David Lee Ross said no, weirdly. Uh, Jean Claude Van Damme, uh, uh, Jan Michael Vincent. Like, we went to a lot of like people that were just comedy, and we were like, what about Reese Darby? And we were like, ah, he'd never do it, and he responded right away. And I think he's the single funniest. Oh, it was so we good. Had, so, man. so much improv. Sure. But then we Amazing. shot that episode in kind of like November ish, yeah. and it was getting yeah. cold. And we Utah. in Utah at, at a place called Willard Bay. It was a very cold saltwater lake. <laughs> we had a hot tub set up. <laughs> yeah, yep. we made the yep. producer rent a hot tub for the day. <laughs> a hot tub on wheels. <laughs> so it would be right next to the water. So the minute we came out, we could jump into the hot tub. For one minute, then they made us get out. <laughs> yeah. 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 Come on. Plenty time. We got to film more. But uh, I, there's that scene where Reese Darby, the shark fighter, comes up out of the water and we had like submerged in the water like a, a like a little lift like a hydraulic lift that was like not functioning super well cuz it's in the water <laughs> and he he had to go, <sighs> go under the water and come out and he was getting so cold and we were like oh man he's going to quit but he was a trooper and right. well, we, well they were going to have fans. a stunt guy do it but then it just didn't work so yeah it, awful. it was yeah. clearly obvious it was the stunt man cuz it was like shooting him right straight <laughs> on <laughs> But, but he, that, he was a good sport. There were so many amazing outtakes from Reese Darby. We could, like, recut the episode three times. That's right. Different jokes that he He was so he good. Was, but was even awesome. even so season incredible. one, we had Weird Al played uh, Super, Super Magic, Magic Power, Power Man. Man. And he also played the, the president. president. The States, yeah. And one of the, like, runners that we were going to have in the show but we never got a chance to do was that Super Magic Power Man disappears from the earth and no one knows where he is because he got disintegrated. And then also the president of the United States was missing, so it was like he was hmm. the president ah. was super magic power the man. The president we, wasn't anyway. Present. Dun, dun, dun. Dun. We, there was a lot of things that we didn't get to do in the show, but anyway, get other guest stars: Lou Diamond Phillips as the, oh my the spirit of the sun, right? John Heater. John Heater as Eagle Claw. Um, we had um, oh Mark Mothersbaugh played. Was Jimmy the Robot's dad? Jimmy the Robot's dad. We had Noelle Wells from Saturday Night Live. I think she's on that show with Aziz Ansari. Mm -hmm. Star had some funny Mm -hmm. lines. Star was great. Um, Sam Levine from uh, Freaks and Geeks. Sam Levine. He didn't really want to dance so much. He didn't want to do the Michael Jackson thing. Or maybe not that he didn't want to do it. He was a sport. Yeah. But he he wasn't used to doing it. Not many people could dance like Michael Jackson. The best, you know, that scene where Pilgrim Boy is, he's dancing and doing this. Um, and with the cameras going around. But I think he had to, like, he had to memorize, he had to mouth all, he had to memorize words. It's was, it was yeah. kind of a big ask. We set up a camera inside the the driver's side of my car, and we just mounted it on my car, and I was just driving around in circles. We were like, action, and I just drove around in circles until we got that scene. Because that was at the end of season one when we had run out of money, and we were just like... Everyone was doing everything. <laughs> so I bet, but Sam did say this is like one of the funnest sets he'd ever been on. Yeah, it was a lot of fun. Uh, I'm trying to think. We had so many great guest stars on the show. Yep. Uh, I'm sure we're forgetting some really good ones. But uh, oh yeah, we had uh, Mikey Way, Mikey we had Mikey Way, Way. and uh, Gerard came in. Guest and writer, director, co-directed, and the Anti Bats episode. And man, there's so many good 
fun things we got to do. Even uh, Paul Rust, who played Paul Rust. your favorite dude. Uh, yeah, Ron Mark. Ron he played, Mark. He played live action Ron Mark. One of the things we definitely humor. tried to do with the stunt casting is find people that were funny. It was mostly comedians and people that could play like comedy straight. Like Weird Al, is plays it, he plays it so straight, but it's hilarious because it's Weird Al playing it very, very dr dramatic, right? So anyway, that, that was one of the fun parts of the show, and that was another thing that we were inf highly influenced from the Batman 66, where they had guest villains all the time, and that's what we wanted to do with our show. Here we have a mini battle tram. Mini battle tram. There it is. Careful, <laughs> careful. <laughs> Does that mean it's a mini Winnie? I think this was the one, the battle, because we have a couple of mini battle trams that were made. Mm -hmm. This was the one that uh, was made for uh, the Shrinky Space Monster Mask. M episode. Mm. Um, what one gets thrown which one? Which, 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 what is that episode called? Showtime. Showtime, the Showtime yeah. episode. No, so this is the one when he picks it up and shakes it around and then he chucks it into space. This was the one that uh, mm. Space Monster M was holding. And the great part about this little one Oh, I think I think this is also the one from um, from Pilgrim Boy, right? Because this. Oh, there you go. This, yep. this little thing lifts up, and then you just we choo -choo. put little missiles inside of it, and we charged them out. Choo -choo 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 -choo. See? I like it. I like it. Take that. We should actually release these as toys. Yep. <laughs> Learning and growing. <laughs> Any day now, we'll get a toy license, and boom. All right, check this out. <laughs> Robot arm. Oh, yeah. Okay. So this is from oh, yes. what episode? This would be... Um, uh, yeah, but... The, uh, what did I call it? Mysterious Egg. Mysterious Egg. Mysterious Egg. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's egg. Right, okay. that's right. The beginning of Mer Mysterious Egg, we're tromping through the woods to tracking down a beast, a monster that escaped from the monster zoo, right? And uh, this was the arm that was actually used for off-camera throat grabbing and arm pinching, right? Ah. Show me how it works there, Eagle Bones. Ah, ah, ah. Anyway, Just like that. <laughs> it's, we spared no expense with the technology. It's one of those things you use to pick up trash yep. that's cleverly disguised as a monster arm. <laughs> anyway. Hollywood magic. Never knew. <laughs> anyway, that was one of, that's one of my favorite episodes. Later in the day, we also picked up lots of trash with us. That's right. Ooh, look at this one. The Mask of Silver Skull. Wow, Eagle Bones. Eagle Bones here has, That's heavy. you know, the That's mask. That's heavy metal right there. Whoa. And rusty. Yeah. Wow. It's a rusty, heavy metal. We need to probably clean this, but uh, this was the actual mask a patina. worn <laughs> by our buddy, right? Mark yeah. Fordham. Mark, our buddy Mark, who uh, played a, a lot of the giant characters that we... Mark is about like six foot five or six, mm -hmm. and he does a lot of character work. He's part of the 501, was it? Yeah, he's a, yeah, he's a, he's a Vader. Uh, Star, Star Wars, Wars Legion. Yeah. Yep. And uh, he plays Darth Vader. Yeah. But he also he did a wonderful job of using some of his Darth Vader costume for part of Silver Skull's costume. Mm -hmm. So if you look. <laughs> this dirt is called authenticity. Yeah, this is aging. It, we spared. It's, it's relic. We spared no expense. We just threw some dirt at it and let let it grow. Actually, we didn't spend <laughs> anything after, and that's why it's. Uh, yeah, this was. Uh, Did someone make that special or? No, it was like just some. Found it. it was like an import kind of a thing that we found online. I, I think it's from Australia, and um, it's not made. In the USA. original one, the eye holes, is a little smaller. Used so for we, Mad Max we, or something. Uh, we opened up the eyes a little bit. We sculpted it a little bit. So this is custom to us, but it, the uh, the old eye holes. The base model is something that we found online, but I don't know, it's kind of cool, and medieval at the same time, right? Magical, mystical, medieval. A large soda. <laughs> Small. <laughs> Can you make that a root beer? <laughs> Thanks for hanging with us all the way. This marathon was the best super marathon we've ever endured, and I don't know about you guys, but Crash? It's the best thing I've ever done. That's right. right now. This has been a lot of fun, and the Aquabad Super Show, we made it for fun people and people that like fun and get fun. And so if you're not into fun, better get on the run. <laughs>